Welcome to the Colby Cast, episode 59. Glad you could join us. Today, the cast welcomes back to the show Colby's very own Everett Byarski and Erica Treat. Among the many other things they do, these two are dedicated to helping students launch their post-high school years, bridging that daunting gap between home and the real world. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Bonnie, liturgical musician, popcorn and podcast fanatic, and Colby homeschooling mom to four lads and lasses of middle and high school age. And I'm Jordan. As a product of homeschooling, I'm proud to teach Greek and Latin for Colby online and serve as the Alumni and Public Relations Director. Okay, moment of reckoning for those of us with graduation on the horizon in our household. Today's episode is helping us toward that end of getting our ducks in a row and get sorted out the particulars we need to keep top of mind as we're heading into this school year. So today I welcome back Ever Byarski, Academic Services Director, and Erica Treat, 12th grade academic advisor. Thanks so much, guys, for coming back to talk to me. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. I'm glad you're back. We are trying to get organized here for high school juniors and seniors. Um, those of us with students a little bit younger than that can certainly benefit from this. Um, I am one to sometimes put things on my calendar a year or two away so that they, I will revisit them later. But so that they, if they slip into my abyss, so to speak, then they will resurface eventually when they need to. So um, if that resonates with anyone else, maybe this can serve to help them in that way. So as we were thinking about college planning, let's start from high level, zoomed out a bit thinking about what happens after high school. A lot of folks might be thinking about that already. Some might not have considered it might be time to start thinking about it. So Everett, as we're discerning our post high school plans with our children, for my family and for many Colby families, preserving and fostering the continued faith formation of our students as they go wherever they're going to go after Colby, this is a very top priority for us. So what do you think about that? As What are some things you offer to families as we're getting started on this college planning business? Yeah, absolutely. And kind of as you mentioned, I think there's there, there's there's two parts to be working through in this college application process. Uh, the first one is kind of a, some of the philosophical approach, you know, and thinking through what are what are the principles. And the second one is going to be dealing with with the mechanics of what are the, the nitty gritty details that you need to be aware of. But I think, uh, you know, as, as Catholics, we believe in, in, in first things. We believe in first principles. And so I think it's a good uh, spot to start. Um, and I think the first thing is to, again, as Catholics, remember that, um, that, that this really should function as a discernment process for, um, for parents, certainly, but also uh, particularly for the students. Of, and when we're talking about discernment, it's important to remember that when it comes to discernment, that Discernment is a process. It isn't something that happens and you're done. And so when you're going through this discernment process, you don't have to be necessarily trying to figure out what God wants from me five or ten years from now. You can focus on what does God want from me three or six months from now. Um, Mm -hmm. And so when we're looking at it, it's thinking about, you know, where is God calling me to be this coming fall? If you're, you know, if you're a senior um, heading into things or, or a junior kind of starting this, where is God calling me to be, you know, a year and a half from now? And if we can think about that, I think that'll make it maybe a little less intimidating. You know, we don't have to discern, is God calling me to be a lawyer or a priest, um, you know, or a welder? That's that's probably not quite what we have to focus on. If we can work on where would God like me to be right now and just keep in mind some of those things that maybe I will end up being whatever it is down the road. I think from my own personal experience, um, I mean, my plans changed dramatically, uh, you know, between uh, within 24 months as far as what was going on, what I thought was going on, what God wanted me to do. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I went from, I was going, I was planning to go to one school. I was going to study international relations uh, with a plan then to head on to law school and possibly look at a career, you know, either in law or working in the state department. Uh, and that was kind of the plan that I had. Okay. Uh, and we went uh, very dramatically from there to uh, going to a completely different school, Catholic school, uh, planning to study philosophy uh, and at least working through a discernment process of, of seminary or not. Yeah. Um, wow. And and so that's where it's important to be just kind of be open to where God is leading you as you you go through this um, and, and know that that God is going to give you some signs. God is going to give you indications. There's going to be uh, times when you feel a sense of peace um, with with uh, certain things that you're encountering, and and that's often a good clue to maybe this is somewhere to be heading. Uh, but we need to realize that 
God ha- doesn't have this, this secret whiteboard that he's written the plan for your life on the back of it. And it's your job to try and guess what's on the other side of that board. That's not how this works. Yeah. Um, and, and, and recognize also that God is going to use the choices that you are making um, as, a, as a student to for your greater good. Mm-hmm. You know, my, I, I thought I was uh, called the priesthood. I spent two years in seminary. They were phenomenal formation. I discerned I wasn't called the priesthood. Um, but everything that I did in those two years in the seminary prepared me for who I am now today. It made me a better husband and a better father uh, and prepared me well for, for what I'm doing now in education with Colby Academy. So I think that's kind of the first thing is to think about is, is let's take a step back and really think through what, you know, where would God like me to be as a student? And, and, or, you know, is, does God want me to take a year off there? You know, there are mission opportunities, uh, you know, for, uh, one of our advisors served a couple of years on the net team, the national evangelization team. You know, so that the college isn't the only option certainly as well. So that's important to be as you're working through this process and thinking about that. Now, the other piece you mentioned is also really crucial. The parents of particularly who have chosen Colby Academy, who want to be, who had their students attending Colby Academy over these many years. Uh, one of the reasons you've probably done that is because you're concerned about um, your children's salvation. Yep. Um, and, and in doing so, you know, it's sometimes it's funny as we, we talk to people, we hear um, things that people are, they've, they've done this for their, their 10, 12 years, whatever it might be. And then they just kind of say, okay, good luck off to the world, have fun. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it'll work out. And, and it's, you know, well, that, why have, we, why did we, why did we work so hard and struggle so hard? Right. If we're not at least looking at how can I continue this? How can I make sure that I, continue to provide those opportunities um, that my, my son or daughter can be working towards the salvation of their own soul. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean you can only attend a Catholic college. That's definitely not the case. But something that, but it's important to think about, you know, what resources is my student going to need when they head off to college? Um, you know, do they, need to, do they need to be on a Catholic, uh, the campus of a Catholic college, especially one that is as faithful to teaching the magisterium? Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are many students who, um, who have done well in, in their, their schooling, but, you know, maybe just as far as the parental discernment, you can look at them and say, you know, I don't know that, uh, you know, attending a secular school or attending a, a Catholic school that may not have quite the same Catholic identity would be good for you. Yeah. You know, it might lead to um, to you falling away from your faith a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, there are some students, uh, myself included, who thinks apologetics was fun, arguing about the faith is a great time, Um <laughs> And, and, and doing so, you know, I'm certainly you could head off to, you know, in my case, I, I headed off to a school, Gonzaga University, which uh, when I went there was kind of an in-between place, Catholic identity-wise, uh, now is, is not in as good of a place, unfortunately. But, but I had a great time. I, I enjoyed arguing about the faith, having discussions about what the church teaches. Um, but the, the biggest part of, I think, whatever is happening here in preserving the faith is the importance of community that uh, students are going to be leaving their family, which has been their domestic church for the past 18 years. Mm -hmm. Um, That has been their center of where they can come back to really nurture the faith. Um, And when you go off to college, it's really important that the student find a similar community. Uh, The Pope Benedict XVI referred to to this as as an island of spiritual concentration, that you can have this this community, this island, um, kind of like a monastery where you can you can go back to, to, to recharge, to refresh, to, to stay faithful. And then from that spot, you can then go out to, to evangelize. Mm-hmm. Um, it tends to be easiest to find these communities on, on the campuses of, of say the Newman guide recommended colleges. Um, so whether it's, you know, university of Dallas, Thomas Barnes college, Franciscan, Ave Maria, Benedictine, um, there, there are quite a number of them. If you want to know more about them, uh, please join us for our college virtual visit programs. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Yeah. Um, so we'll go into more details about those. And those are great schools that they are faithful to the Catholic church, excellent Catholic identity, finding a community on those campuses is, is pretty easy. Yeah. Um, but if you're not going to one of those schools for, for a number of different reasons, uh, they don't have the program you, you want, um, they're not the right fit, uh, finances, location, whatever it might be, there are a lot of reasons, then, then what community does exist near you? Um, and the first thing I would always recommend is, is try and get to the school uh, and find, uh, find daily mass. Um, you know, if it's, if it's a, a regular Catholic school, there should be daily mass already. If it is a, a state school, then, then there ought to be some kind of Newman Center, uh, Catholic Life Center, whatever it might be. And in doing, in doing that, and they ought to have something like daily mass. And the reason I suggest this is because if you go to daily mass, the students who attend daily mass are the kind of students who are most likely to be able to tell you 
what it's like to be a faithful Catholic on that campus. Mm -hmm. um, if the answer is there are no daily masses, that's probably not a good sign. Uh, if the answer is there are daily masses, but no students go to them, also probably not a good sign, that, that it may be difficult to find the kind of community that, that you really want if you're going to be able to nurture uh, and continue to grow in the faith. Because now is the time when students are stepping out on their own. Now they have to take some of that own responsibility. And if they don't have the support system that that same scaffolding to kind of that, that each can lift each other up, uh, then it becomes e really easy to slip away. Mm -hmm. These are things that are, as, as we've taken on the education of our children, first in parochial school and now in homeschool, primary reason for being is that we have our faith right in the center of it. And yes, it, we are, it's so easy to fall into that mindset of, okay, graduation, good luck. Now you're an adult, so to speak, you're 18, whatever. So you're on your own. That's not actually how that goes, but it's so easy to think that it is that very like light switch kind of thing that it's all right, then that's that. And it's, it's so not <laughs> some all, all good reminders that this relationship continues and this development continues and, and there's still a lot of growing yet to do. And and the discernment continues too. also. That was a, a really good point I thought you made among several of them, that the discernment is a process and it's not a one and done kind of thing. And just like we've talked about with educating at home, and however we're doing that with Colby on, online or at home, it's it can be a year to year decision. It can be, we take it one step at a time. It's not just a blanket, like this is it for here on out. So with the discernment process for life after Colby, the same, same thing applies. I think that these are good reminders, to, especially as it's looming large and we're thinking we have a lot of pressure on us to make big decisions that we're not kind of fenced in with those. Okay, and then keeping top of mind that the formation we've engaged in for our children, the part we have played in, in their faith formation and trying to pass the faith on to them, that yes, it comes to a point where it's theirs to own and doing all we can to foster that is part of why we're doing this in the first place. But then um, allowing that to, process to happen, that they that they need to uh, to own it themselves, that's, I think it's hard for parents. Do you have suggestions for parents who are in that spot where they're right on that cusp? Sure. I'm an organizational person. So my inclination <laughs> was to just start getting right into spreadsheets and planning <laughs> and pros and cons lists. But I actually listened to um, one of the Colby college planning um, seminars and I heard Everett's words and I thought, wow, I was approaching this the wrong way. We need to do this first. We need to talk about discernment first. And at the same time, I also found that really comforting. Um, as a military spouse, we've moved a lot. And one of my mantras is one thing at a time. You don't have to do the whole entire move in a day, right? Just with college, same with college and this decision, you don't have to plan your whole entire life right now, you know, as a, as a rising senior in college. But definitely do think about what's what's going to happen the year after college or, you know, the four years after college. Take it in those bite-sized chunks in terms of discernment even um, and choices. And then you can start looking at going to the next phase of, of the nitty gritty stuff that I just love, all the organizational pieces. <laughs> Right. There's great comfort in that. And we'll just get it all organized. And yeah, there's exactly. so much to be said too for involving the students. Like this is, this is your deal. This is like, right. this is not all mine to do. And that for the, many of us, I, I include myself in this. That is my comfort zone. Like, okay, I'll just get it all. I can do it myself. Mm -hmm. I'll get it situated and y'all just, I'll let you know. But that's not where we are now with our students at this point no. in their right. lives. It's, so. it's their decision. Um, and it's, it's their, it's really their discernment process and their choice. So one of the things I try to remind my son of as we were going through this recently um, and myself was let's pray first. Let's put that on the top. And then as far as organizational things, I was there to support him, but he really needed to do his pros and cons list. Cause it's not my, I can do my own pros and cons right. list, but that doesn't, you know, I'm not the one who's going to be spending four years at the school or whatever mm -hmm. he is. So mm -hmm. it needed to be his thing. And it was great because we set up shared documents and so we could work on things 
And it was really encouraging for me because I could tell when he was working on lists and checking things off of lists because we were sharing notes and Excel docs and stuff like that. So I could kind of see his movement on things. And that was that was exciting as a parent to see that and to see that he was engaging. And um, as an advisor, I love it when the students are on the calls Um, When they're emailing me, I've had parents say, I hope they're not bugging you. Uh, (laughs) Like, No, no, it's the opposite. It's great to hear from them. And it helps a lot to um, be able to pray for them and to be able to support them with all their nuts and bolts stuff too. Oh, I love it. I, so a couple of things on the shared documents, that's a great idea for you guys to be working on them as, as you're able to individually, but then seeing each other's progress and for you to check in on, on your son's progress without you having to ask him about it or, or, you know, continually remind him or whatever word you want to use for that. (laughs) Have you done this? Have you done that? You know, like you can see whether or not it's been done. Yep. And keeping the prayer front and center. That's, that's so important. And just having them take ownership of it. It, It's when we're in the the mode of, okay, I've got to manage all this. It's not, it's not that anymore, as I said. So it's great to hear your experience too, of where you are yourself with your family, Erica. This is a very multi-layered from all the angles. This is (laughs) an ideal person to be talking to us about this. One thing to piggyback on on that, what what Eric was talking about, you know, for especially for long time Colby families, you know, we've we may have been working with you for eight or ten or twelve years. Mm-hmm. Um, you might a student might have been with us since kindergarten, and and over the years, our primary contact tends to be with parents. However, as we start to get up into eleventh and twelfth grade, um, that's really the time that at least in, in some aspects, students should be starting to interact with their advisors if they aren't already. That, that there should be, especially as, as a 12th grader, uh, certainly parents can be talking to Ms. Street. That's fine. That's great. Um, and there are a lot of things that they'll be really helpful for. But, but in 11th and 12th grade, now is the time to be start talking to, um, to our 11th grade advisor, our 12th grade advisor, that they can start working and making this, this process their own. That, that this is, certainly the parents are going to continue to support them throughout uh, the way. But this is this is the point where where our advisors are very interested and and willing and would like to support students specifically in this process, and it's going to help us as well. It's going to help us do a better job of providing support uh, for families, and it's going to also help us do a better job when we are working on those college uh, applications mm-hmm. and some of the again some of those nitty gritty details that that we'll talk about is if um, I or, or Miss Squire or Miss Treat. If we have relationships built with with students, then we were working on applications. We're able to do a lot more for them. Mm-hmm. You know, then that reminds me of a conversation I had with you, Everett, a while back. And you mentioned something about speaking with my eldest with as he's getting older. And I was like, "Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Like, how do we? <laughs> that didn't even occur to me. It was quite a surprise." And so, what does that look like then? I think the first thing that I would recommend to parents to do is share your students grade report with them. They (laughs) should know what that document looks like. They should know what, you know, what credits they've received for classes, um, what their GPA is, which, you know, that stuff's on there. Um, They should know that stuff. And then when you schedule a call to talk about course selections and things like that, they can just be there. And a lot of times they'll chime in and chat about things. Email is great too. A lot of students email. Um, The only caveat with that is if it's a personal email address, they need to make sure that they copy their parents on the correspondence Mm -hmm. um, via email. But yes, that's all great. And, um, you know, as we're getting here, some things don't require a full appointment slot. Some things are, I'm going to just do a quick call and ask a question to my extension. That's great too. And they can, if I'm not available, they can leave a voicemail and I'll, I'll call them back. So that kind of stuff, there are several ways you can contact an advisor and it's great if the students are using those different methods. Hold on. We can like make a phone call, like dial numbers and like yeah. place a live call in real time. <laughs> like, yeah. Phone ringing. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> it's funny how quickly that goes by the wayside. It's when it's, I'll just send an email or I'll just... Uh, have a chat or whatever, oh, we can actually call. And sometimes it's so much easier to talk about these things on the phone. And what a good skill also for our children who are growing up digital natives for whom the phone is far less frequently used, right? For conversation, right? So 
thinking about some of those skills they need going forward outside of the academic, the conversational skills on the phone. Great time to practice that, it sounds like. Yeah, this is a good time to start transitioning to your students taking ownership of their own stuff, their own Mm -hmm. um, academic record, and also reaching out to people themselves instead of having their their parent slash secretary (laughs) doing all of this stuff for them. (laughs) So let's, let's shift a little bit. So we've come through a process of discernment and landed at applying to college, like college being the next step after Colby. Erica, talk to us about that college selection process. It's pretty daunting just looking at what's out there. Sure. So once you've done the foundational stuff um, with discernment and you found yourself at college, so the next step is what college? And we have five things that tend to be big things that you might want to consider. First, will be, these are not in, in order. So my, the number one that I mentioned here might be number five for a student. Okay. Although the number one I mentioned is actually a pretty big one for, for most students <laughs> and that's financial. So you're going to want to look at the numbers and see if this is something feasible financially. And that's going to look different for different families, um, different students, what scholarships you can get, FAFSA, stuff like that. But that's something to look at location. So distance from home, what kind of setting you're in, rural, a city, things like that. That can make a big difference. What a campus feels like. Does it feel cozy to you when you get there? Does it feel intimidating and uncomfortable? This is why going to visit colleges is important. You want to know how it feels to you and if that is a setting you feel like you could live and thrive in for, you know, 4 years size. Do you want to go to a big school, small school? A lot of that will impact the feel of a school too. If you're one in thousands or if you're, you know, one in a a much smaller cohort, what degrees are available? So if you're looking for um, a very specific field, maybe a school has a great genetics program and you want to do genetics. So that would maybe be a big deal. So look at what degrees they have available. Does that match with with your discernment process and what you think you might need for the phase after? Then the mission of the school. Is it a Catholic school? Do you want to do a classical type of great books program? Are you looking for a technical school or somewhere where you can learn to become a pilot? Uh, you know, things like that all matter. Yeah. So those are kind of the big ones that we would recommend. And the student needs to ask and needs to be discussing what's important to them. What do they want? What are their top five priorities? Mm -hmm. They should rank those. And then it'll help a lot because if you really want a school with a genetics program and only certain schools have that, that's going to eliminate a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Or if you really want a school in a big city, that will eliminate (laughs) some Uh, or rural might eliminate quite a few more, actually, (laughs) if you really want a rural school, (laughs) but things like that will help you narrow down the list from, you know, thousands of colleges to start honing it down to a much more approachable list. That makes sense. That's a great starting point, thinking about what are the top priorities and, and that can cut a lot out right away. That's great. Well, and you could create a pros and cons list or or a, just a factors list. Does this school check off my big factors? And some students, some of their factors might be things that aren't on this list, such as what are the freshman sophomore dorms like? Mm-hmm. I really care about what my room <laughs> room looks like at college. And so that might be something that's on their own personal list. But I think they start with their own personal list and then begin targeting colleges, you could do this in many different organizational ways. It could just be looking around at websites and comparing them to your list and knocking schools off that that don't work. Or it could be coming up with a spreadsheet um, or pros and cons list for each school. I think for um, uh, my own personal process that I supported my child through recently, the pros and cons list was it was a a next tier sort of list. We were looking at all of these big factors sort of 
eliminating schools off. And then once we started to hone the list down, that's when we started really doing like spreadsheets. And then really the pros and cons list was when we were down to a few colleges that it's like, these are the ones I just need to choose (laughs) between these two or three schools. Mm -hmm. So when a student's applying, I don't recommend applying to this huge wide list of 10, 15 schools. You should probably have your list honed down to 10 or less by the time you start applying. Okay. And then from there, you'll start making it smaller once you receive your financial aid offers and you have more information to really start picking that one school. Okay. That's a good way to organize it all to kind of keep sort of a tracking system going too. I think I can see that being a way to note, okay, I've done this piece and sort of keep track of the deadlines too. Once you've got it whittled down to uh, the few that you want to pursue further, that sounds like a spreadsheet might be a good place for that as well. I'm a big fan of color coding. That seems like a good place to color code stuff. (laughs) Most of the deadlines do fall on key sort of dates for the most part. Okay. So it's not going to be that complicated. Um, in terms of the application deadlines, because most schools, they have deadlines. Some of the early ones are at the beginning of October, but a lot of them are at the end of October or the beginning of December kind of timeframe. Okay. And then for the later applications, there are some January, February dates, but they're not all over the place. They're sort of um, staggered throughout the fall and winter. So it's not as crazy. And then if, if you've already narrowed your list down to say, you know, five schools, mm-hmm. that's not as much to track. If you're applying to, you know, 15 schools, well, that's a lot, that's a lot more to keep track of. Mm-hmm. Okay. That makes good sense. Okay. So we've got it narrowed down at this point, then the applications begin and Everett, you have some tips for crafting college applications that stand out from the crowd. That's, so where's a good starting point for that? Right. And this is, um, I mean, really, and this is a particularly if you're, you know, if you, right now you have a parent who has even a freshman or sophomore, this is probably the part that's going to be most relevant to you. Uh, the part that we're going to talk about next, the nitty gritty, you can kind of keep in the back of your head. You probably don't need to be getting back to this and maybe until you have a junior. But this is important, I think, for, for anybody to think about you know, when we are, or when you have a student who's working on an application, that the, the way the process will work is on the college's side, they are going to have an admissions counselor who's reviewing these applications. Uh, and they get a lot of admissions applications. Um, and, and when I say a lot, you know, if you at, even at a, a mid-sized school, maybe the school has, has 4,000 undergraduates, uh, which is kind of a, a, mid, a small to mid-sized college. Well, those 4,000 graduates means there's roughly 1,000 per class. To get to that 1,000 students per class, they might receive 8,000, 12,000, 20,000 applications. Wow. And so, especially as, as you look at more competitive universities, universities that have a higher number of applications relative to the number of available slots, they're going to be reviewing a lot of those applications. Your goal in this is to stand out in a positive way. Uh, you want them to remember your application. You want it to be memorable. And now there's some there's some minimum requirements. Every college will have kind of a you know some base things they're looking for. It might be test scores, it might be GPAs, uh, whatever you know. It might be minimum numbers of classes. So the, all of those things are important to to make sure that you can clear the bar. Because if you don't clear the bar, your application won't even get looked at. It'll just get discarded. But once you've cleared the bar and your application is going to be looked at, certainly you want to have a good GPA. You want to have good test scores. You want to have have taken rigorous classes. So all of those things are going to be important. But to, to stand out, you want something else, something that, that's going to make them remember who you are. And, and the two most common ways that's going to happen is either with uh, extracurricular activities or with an essay, possibly with a recommendation letter, but, but that's less likely. Because everybody knows, uh, has the idea that extracurricular activities are important, um, and they are very important. But one of the kind of misconceptions that I hear a lot of time is, you know, my student needs to be doing as many things as possible that they need to have eight different extracurricular activities. And that's definitely not the case. Because when a college says we want a well-rounded student body um, and a well-rounded student, I mean, they do want a well-rounded student. They want a student who's well-formed. But well-rounded doesn't mean you do, uh, you're all over the place, kind of a scattershot approach to things. Well-rounded means that you're well-formed as an individual. And uh, if you're, they're going to have a well-rounded student body, having every student who has done 12 different extracurricular activities 
doesn't provide a lot of it just provides kind of a boring student body because none of them have any serious interests or hobbies or things they're going to drive forward okay yeah so what they really want is they want you know the the several students who have a deep uh, passion for robotics and they want you know students who have um, interests in um, cross-country running and you know students who have have uh, music and and the arts uh, theater whatever it might be they want students who have have things that they're passionate about things that they have committed to um, because when they get to college those students are then going to find the the theater club they're going to look around and say i love ultimate frisbee there's not an ultimate team on this campus i'm going to start one and they're going to put something together. They, so the, they want people who have passion. They want people who have some leadership skills, people who are going to invest in things. And the way to show that is by what you've been doing, especially in high school. Um, so rather than having eight activities, have one or two activities, three activities that you have been passionate about, that you've committed 100, 200, 300 hours to over the course of your, your high school career in whatever it might be, whether it's, it's the sports or it's arts, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, all kinds of things, debate, whatever it might be, because they want to see, oh, this student has been doing this for four years. Um, yeah. the, their junior year, they were the vice president of something or another. The, the senior year, they were the president. You know, they, they had some sort of leadership role. Um, they were doing something that, that had a sense of responsibility. Um, because that's going to be assigned to them that, that you, when you get to campus, are going to be interested in driving something forward, Makes sense. Um, a fellowship group, whatever it might be. And so that's the key. You know, similarly, uh, entrepreneurship, definitely. If you have a student who, um, you know, is, is creative and has, has developed this uh, you know, small business um, or has been involved in this uh, really unique service program. Mm -hmm. Many years back, I had a student who they partnered with a cancer ward to bring in lambs to be held by the um, the patients as just a source of comfort, yeah. um, and so and that's the sort of thing. Obviously, that stands out to me. That's probably twelve years ago that, that I was working with a student, mm -hmm. but it's the sort of thing that remembers. Oh yes, that's this is the student who developed this program that brought lambs, lamb therapy is what he called it, into into the, the hospitals, and, and they're going to remember. Wow, that's what a what sense of creativity, a sense of, of entrepreneurship. Um, a sense of care for others, certainly, to, mm -hmm. to want to do something like this. You know, similarly, a number of years ago, I had a student who got an internship working with local Department of Engineering, and she spent her summer helping them build a bridge. Right. Um, and so she can say she helped build a, an actual bridge, um, which is the sort of thing that people go, oh, yes, that's the young woman. She built a bridge. And so when they're, they're reviewing those applications, thinking through, you know, who do I want to have? I want the bridge builder. I want the, the land therapy person. And those are the things that are going to help you kind of stand out in, in going through that process. And so what is it, you know, what is it that you've, you've done, especially if, if you're the parent to a freshman or sophomore, identify what those, those passions are mm -hmm. and, and let your students start kind of running with them to see where it takes them rather than saying, you know, I, I want you doing, you know, let's, let's get uh, you know, five hours of this and 10 hours of that. And you're just kind of doing a little bit of this in here. You know, that's not really going to provide much in the way of formation for the students in the same way that, that working through this and doing it will be. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is that there are some things that are more common than others, and depending on what school you're applying to, there are some things that will be more interesting than others. For example, if you are applying to a Newman Guide Catholic school, and your special thing is that you had a significant leadership role in the altar servers guild that you participate in and you know, rose through the ranks and all of those things, that they might think that's pretty interesting and be involved in. If you're applying to a secular school, you might need to find a different way to sell that. You might sell it as leadership, sell it as organization, um, but probably focus maybe less on the faith aspect of that because that's something they're not in, they're, they're less interested in. Eagle scouting is great. Uh, being an Eagle Scout is, is a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, some schools are going to be more interested in that than others are gonna, going to be. So those are things to think in mind that you want to tailor whatever this, this thing is that you have to the college that you're applying to. Okay. And some colleges will call this the spike. That they're looking for on your application one or two spikes, the things that are going to set you out as you have a spike here and a spike here rather than just kind of this, this amorphous blob. <laughs> um, that will set you apart. Then the second way you do this, similar concept, is on your essay. When you're writing your, your application essay, for example, one common question might be um, a book that's really influenced you. Now, if you're applying to Newman Guide Catholic Schools, you might think, you know what, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, everybody, we, I love Tolkien. Tolkien has a significant influence in your life. And, it's, and it, absolutely. Uh, if you attended our, our graduation ceremony this year, um, phenomenal speaker, uh, bringing in Lord of the Rings to talk about the sense of adventure as we head out into the world. However, if you're applying to Newman Guide School, 
they are going to receive hundreds of essays on the Lord of the Rings. So if you want to stand out, you had better be the best Lord of the Rings essay they've ever read, which, which is challenging. That's really tough to do. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you might consider what other books have I read that maybe Lord of the Rings is my favorite book. What's my second favorite book or third favorite book that, that if I write an essay on Dostoevsky um, or on no, whatever it might be on, on Plato, on some, some texts, we read a lot of books here at Colby. Um, surely there's something else that, that you've read that really stood out to you. Mm-hmm. And, and it's going to be a, a lot easier for you to stand out in a crowd when they're reading, oh yeah, that's the, you know, I had a student uh, wrote a book about Tolstoy. I don't think I've ever had a student write about Tolstoy before. Okay. So that they can remember who you are from, from that essay you wrote. Uh, similarly, there's, there's all kinds of different essay prompts. They'll talk about, you know, important things in your life, things that have led to changes. The goal is to try and, you know, let them know who you are uh, in this essay in a way that's going to help them remember you. Wow. And sometimes I hear people mention how much email they get in a day. It's a, an alarming amount. That sounds like an equivalent with the applications. That's a lot of applications to sort through. I can certainly see the needs to establish quickly your distinctiveness <laughs> through these various ways. Sure. In these early days, the students are working on the actual application. Okay. So that means transcripts, letters of recommendation, college entrance exam scores. They're compiling all of these pieces for the schools. And most schools require a lot of these things, if not all of these things. So that's what they're doing in this August, September, October, even some into November and December timeline. They're pulling all of these pieces together and they're keeping the deadlines in mind. And so they could they could use our, our timeline that we like to share. But even our timeline, there's there's wiggle room. So, you know, if you start a little bit later or you're not sure until a little bit later, that's okay. You'll just sort of look and start bringing those pieces together for your applications. Then depending on when you applied, if you applied early, some of the schools you'll hear back very soon. So if students are applying in October, they'll likely know before Christmas okay. to some of these schools oh. if if they got in. And when the schools send you your admission packet, it also has financial aid information in there. So what sort of scholarships are on offer for that school? And that's when you can really start taking those pieces and comparing your offers and also looking at what sort of departmental scholarships are available and applying for those. Some of those deadlines for the departmental scholarships are in November and December. So students need to be aware of those and seeking those out early. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a good point about the scholarships too. There are all kinds of scholarship sources, right? From the schools themselves and the departments, but then community-based or even content like essay submissions all, all over the place, right? Do you find that people have good success with a variety of scholarships, putting them all together to, to finance the, the college selection? That seems to be the case. I mean, I, I don't know that a lot of parents share that, the actual numbers and how that will work. Have you had that experience, Everett? You know, sometimes it it's, certainly depends, you know, and we certainly we, we enjoy and we appreciate when they do give us those reports, but it's helpful to us to know what they're doing. And there's a spot when the when students get to the end of their senior year and they're requesting uh, their uh, diplomas, there is a spot on there for information about colleges. And we definitely appreciate uh, people providing that information to us because that helps us uh, in our own tracking. But, you know, as far as, as scholarships in general, our students are do very well um, with, with scholarships. Uh, the, you know, obviously the, the, the costs of state schools tend to be lower, uh, and then the scholarships towards state schools tend to be conventionally lower as well, um, as far as kind of bringing costs down and, and adjusting those costs. We're private schools, so the costs tend to be higher, but scholarships also tend to be higher. We've certainly had students who have won um, competitions, scholarship competitions, for com- uh, full tuition to schools like Christendom or to Benedictine uh, the University of Dallas. Um, so there, there are opportunities out there. Uh, but historically, our students have done very well in their financial aid process uh, and in their awards. Mm-hmm. Okay. And sometimes those extra departmental or um, the, the presidential scholarship type competitions that a student will be eligible for and invited to participate in round everything out. Um, so maybe if they don't get one of those, they can get a departmental scholarship to help sort of piece beyond what they receive as their initial scholarship offer and round everything out so that it's more approachable. And then 
other students um, are able to find scholarships that are specific to their demographics. Sometimes there are scholarships out there, for example, for military kids Mm -hmm. and the competition pool is smaller because you're talking about a small, (laughs) smaller population. So looking into things like that might be a great idea to just fill out the complete financial package and make it something that's going to be possible for certain schools. And Everett's point about the state schools is an interesting one. And this is actually something I've heard a lot this year. I've heard from a lot of students who, because they get such big offers from private schools, when they're crunching the numbers, the state schools have smaller tuition, but their offers are much smaller too. And so on the balance, the private school is actually a better financial proposition than the state school because of the amount of scholarships that students received. And this is something I've heard from a number of families this year that they were just like, well, we aren't even going to do the state school because uh, the numbers aren't even as good. Wow. That's, I'm surprised to hear that. It seems like I a sense of even if you get a big scholarship that it's still only going to cover half or whatever. And the half is left is still significant and that state school is always less expensive. It's a really important point to make. And that's why it's important to have some kind of tracking of the, the base cost um, of, of attendance and those financial aid offers so that you can do that comparison. Mm-hmm. Um, it isn't an uncommon phenomenon that's, that after you review them, you will find that, right, it is a better financial opportunity for you to attend a private school than a state school, depending on what your financial aid offers are. For some state schools are better, for some private schools are better, it'll depend on those offers. But the, the idea that state schools are always cheaper isn't true. Wow. They're often cheaper. Certainly their base, twi- their base is much lower. But that's why those those financial aid offers are so crucial. Uh, and that's why you want to make sure that you're getting your applications in early. Because if, you are, if you're running into late deadlines, um, then there are possibilities that they may have already committed their financial aid money. Um, so you want to make sure that you're getting those applications in you know, well ahead of the deadlines so that you'll be able to have the opportunity to, to be a part of not just their, their standard scholarships, but also the opportunity to be, be invited to, to participate in any scholarship competitions they might have. Okay, good to know. This is a great place to use an Excel <laughs> spreadsheet because you can definitely plug in the base tuition, uh, books and fees. The, the schools will tell you these amounts. And some schools have much higher fees than other schools. Mm-hmm. So that could actually make a big difference um, to a student's bottom line. Okay. So it doesn't have to be Excel, but that makes it easier. Um, <laughs> but it's important to actually look at all of the numbers involved, not just tuition, for example. Yeah. Okay, so we've got financial situation, we've got applications and essays. Another piece of this would be the letters of recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? Approaching folks, asking them to write letters on one's behalf is a a dicey prospect, I would think. Maybe not. From your perspective, what? how do you coach students through approaching people to write letters of recommendation? And before they get to that point, all that area of letters of recommendation. Sure. I think uh, along the line, junior year in particular, they should be thinking about a teacher because they will need a teacher recommendation um, for sure. A teacher who they've connected with over the years, who knows them fairly well and can say so because applications ask, how long have you known this student? A lot of them will ask questions along those lines. How well do you know this student? Stuff like that. So Find a teacher, a coach, something like that. Now, coaches aren't accepted for all schools. Most schools do require a teacher recommendation of some kind. So find someone like that who you just sort of have in mind. Okay, I'm going to ask this person. And then my recommendation is to reach out to them directly as soon as possible if you're already a senior. But if you're a junior, you know, spring semester, ask them. Um, would you be able to write a strong re- letter of recommendation for me for college? And then if they say yes, then you ask if they you would like any supporting documentation or if there's anything you can provide to help with that. But do not, I do not recommend just emailing them. I need a letter of recommendation and then dumping all of these documents yeah. on them. That's not the right approach. <laughs> um, <laughs> and give them plenty of time because it doesn't feel nice to have a very short deadline. You don't want your person writing a letter of recommendation to be in a huge time crunch. Think about what that might look like. So ask early and 
have good etiquette as you go along and let the person, once they agree, let them know what sort of deadlines you're working with, where you're applying. So that they have this bigger picture. They know you, they know um, how you perform in class or whatever, but share with them some of what's going on in terms of where you're planning to apply, what kind of deadlines you have, and when you might need that actual letter to be submitted to Common App or to a school's portal or whatever. Okay. Yep. And I think one piece to, to add on to that is as you're thinking about it, especially for uh, your students who have been in some sort of home-based education, uh, they've enrolled with us here at Colby, sometimes they can be nervous about, you know, who do I ask to do this? Now, certainly if you've been doing online classes with us, uh, you, you, you have teachers, those are our full teachers, traditional teachers, they can definitely do them. Make sure you follow uh, you know, everything that Eric just said. If you haven't been doing online classes, you've been doing our traditional homeschool program, there still are options for you. The first option uh, is potentially one of your grade level advisors. So this would be someone who has had a chance to be reviewing your work at least over one year, possibly more, depending on, on how that has worked out. So that's a possibility. Uh, if you want to take advantage of that possibility, you want to, again, want to make sure you talk to them early, want to let them know what's going on. Um, they may ask for some additional work samples, possibly, okay. to, again, take a look at some of your work to re refresh their memories. And so they, they may ask for some things to help them in the process, but we can certainly do that for you. Parents can write teacher letter recommendations at most schools. Uh, the key thing to keep in mind is that when you're writing a, a, a teacher letter recommendation as a parent, that you need to be speaking about the student from a teacher's perspective. They don't want to hear about, you know, how your son is such a nice boy. They want to be hearing, you know, in his in his literature class, he has, you know, excellent analytical skills, um, as demonstrated by this paper that he wrote. He compared and contrasted, you know, Shakespeare and Dante, uh, and and he had this these excellent points and, and really fantastic essay. They want to talk about your, his academic skills. Okay. Um, is going to be the primary thing that they're looking for. So if you're going to be, write them as a parent, uh, that will often work. Many schools are okay with that. Um, not all schools so you want to check. Um, so that could happen. The other thing is, you know, many of our, our traditional homeschool parents have taken advantage of, if not our online classes, perhaps there's a local co-op that, that your student's been involved in. Or if your student, maybe you did some dual enrollment courses. You took a course at a college or a community college. A dual enrollment professor, a, an actual college professor who is willing to write an essay for you is a, is a fantastic choice because they can speak to your ability to... Uh, perform academically at a college level already. So if you've, if you've already done dual credit courses, then that's a great choice. Um, so just kind of be thinking about, you know, who could that person be? Uh, if you're early on, if you're a freshman or sophomore right now, you, you've got uh, parents with students early on, you might be thinking about that right now for, do I have someone in mind? If I don't have one, someone in mind, how will I get someone? Okay. Whether that's the Colby advisor, whether that's taking a dual credit course, taking an online course, taking a course at a local co-op, whatever it might be. But thinking through that process of trying to think early to make sure you put your student in a position that their end of junior year, heading into senior year, you aren't scrambling to figure out who should this person be. I like that's like kind of zooming out the lens. I was going to ask you about that, actually. So you spoke right to that, that question of if we've done mostly at home, how do we sort out who could write when? So that's great. I think it's interesting. It, thinking about these ways when we are helping our children call our advi their advisor and, and speak with them on the phone or approach someone about writing a letter of recommendation and then supplying the information in a timely manner, including where to submit it when it's done, and then following up with a thank you, here's what how that turned out, <laughs> all these um, sort of soft skills, like um, interpersonal skills that come along with it. This is part of the deal of this whole process. There is one little point to add. And that is for the counselor letter of recommendation. Many schools require it. It seemed like it was about half and half last year. Okay. But for that, we can help you take care of that too. You do need to go onto the Colby website. We have a form, a letter of recommendation request form okay. that can be submitted. And we ask for some additional information on there. So even if the student selects us in Common App, we do not automatically do a counselor letter of recommendation. Mm -hmm. To initiate that, they need to fill out the request form on the Colby website. Okay, add that to the list. So is along with these other pieces, where how does the role of a resume factor in? Do, do students, are they creating resumes at the same time along with their other application materials? Is that typically something that's part of that? I think it's good to have one queued up. I recommended to the juniors last year to work on them in the spring of junior year when you're not working on all of the pieces and 
everything involved with the college application process on top of academics. So if they haven't already done that, oh, okay. if they're in the thick of senior fall applications, if they don't need them, then at that point, I wouldn't necessarily prioritize it. But we found this year that resumes were needed for scholarships. A number of scholarship applications required resumes. So maybe you shift the prioritization of that depending on where you're at in your academic career. But if you're a junior in spring, take care of that. If it's senior summer, take care of that. If it's fall and you're just slammed with all kinds of other stuff and you don't actually need it for the applications, maybe push that to once you've submitted your applications, then put that together and have it queued up if you might need it for scholarships. It seems like some college applications have that as a piece, but I can't really remember that. Do you know if that's the case, Everett? So as far as resumes go, the while they're, they're really important for, for rec- letters of recommendation, mm-hmm. uh, recommenders often want to see them. As Erica mentioned, uh, also many scholarships are going to want to see that, that resume that you compiled. Colleges very rarely require the resume itself. Mm-hmm. However, they're going to have sections on the application that are going to ask you about your activities, sometimes about work experience. The benefit of having that resume ready is that you're going to already have the pieces that you want so you can toss them onto um, that application. Uh, similarly, awards is another uh, common one. So if there are awards you've received, you know, as, as Ms. Tree mentioned, back in your junior year, if you're going to be working on compiling those, so you don't have to remember when you're in the thick of it senior year, what awards did I win? If you have all that ready on your on your resume, then when it comes to the college application, you'll be able to take them and you're going to plug them right in, which is great. Doing it as you go along probably helps. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Do it as you go along. So if a parent or student is listening to this really early in their high school career, this is something you can do. You can start your resume and build it over the course of your high school career. And these are usually things that don't show up on your transcript. So and remembering something from three years ago is tricky. Like, will you remember? Probably not. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. But if you wrote it down when you were a freshman and you did this great thing as a freshman, you'll have that piece to draw from. So the sooner you have your resume in place, the better, really. Yeah. (laughs) After you send it, you'll remember. (laughs) It seems like a a good exercise, just a handy tool as it's meant to be, if even for yourself as you're going along, Mm -hmm. preparing these other pieces. And then to keep that updated and hear another life skill. It can be handy for jobs, too, if they decide to have a job junior, senior year. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many uses for it, and then they can maintain it after high school. So it's really just, it's a really worthwhile thing to take some time to do. Okay, so then that gets us to the point of the standardized test piece, the ACT, SAT, CLT, even before that in um, sophomore and junior year, the PSAT Mm -hmm. And as families who are schooling at home, this can be a tricky business. I speak from experience here, and it's sometimes a matter of choosing which wall to bang my head against, which (laughs) which, uh, how much I want to pursue this particular um, (laughs) exam at this particular time. So that was my experience with AP exams. We did find a place locally for my eldest to take the PSAT as a practice as a 10th grader. It was a private school in town. It involved a lot of phone calls for me, but at this private school allowed him to take it there. Our public school district did not, and the same was true for the AP. So we eventually found another private school that allowed him to take the AP test remotely, but that took some doing. So it did require starting out pretty early in the year and mm-hmm. making a lot of inquiries about that. So to that end, I, I bet the national exam dates for these tests, if they're not already available, they soon will be. Would that be accurate? I'm sure they're out. They publish them year round. So students will take, they can start taking SAT, ACT, stuff like that in the sort of late winter, their junior year and okay, or in spring, see how they do and decide if they want to do a summer or fall, another crack at it. Uh, The benefit with the SAT is a lot of schools will super score. So they'll take your highest score in different sections and then create a super score. Mm. Um, So that can be beneficial. I think it partially depends on your own personal approach to those tests and how much time your student wants to invest. So it's also a decision they have to make if they want to put a lot of time into those. 
I will say that I think they definitely help with scholarships, even though a lot of schools are optional right now because of all of the COVID challenges and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Having that objective data point can be very helpful, especially for students coming from sort of a non-traditional background, like a lot of our students are. It can help. And the College Board website, the AP website, CLT, you can go to their websites and see what test dates they have available and locations. So that's what I would recommend for that. For the AP exam, I would reach out to a school probably during the late spring, summer. It's hard to get a hold of school counselors in the summer sometimes, Mm -hmm. but um, most of them are putting their applications together in September and October to order the tests. Mm -hmm. So you want to be on their radar Mm -hmm. early and then the their latest deadlines are sometimes in the spring, but you should definitely not wait till spring if you want to take the AP exam. You should find a location in the fall because if a school isn't willing to accommodate, then it can be an issue. Um, I've had really good luck um, with local public schools and local private schools for the PSAT and the AP exams, but I know that is not a shared experience with other with other Colby parents. Nope. Um, nope. <laughs> so I think the earlier you start, it just gives you more of an opportunity to secure a seat for your student for uh, tests like the PSAT and the AP in particular. The other ones, those you just sign up on the websites basically, and then you show up. So those are not as challenging, mm-hmm. but the PSAT and the AP exams, you do have to get accommodation. So, yes. And what you want to do is you want to go on to the College Board website. They're going to give you a list of schools in your area that offer those tests so that you can start contacting them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, so that's the first thing you're going to be doing is you're going to be only looking at the AP site. Because the AP site is where you're going to find out who has this test. Because the way it works is that the tests for, for these two types of tests are ordered by the school. So as Ms. Street was talking about, mm-hmm. you know, they'll put in their initial orders in the fall um, sometimes, this year in particular, they'll allow changes to those orders into the spring, but you, you don't want to depend on that. Um, and so you, you find those schools, you identify them, you reach out to them. Uh, my experience has been that kind of nationwide, you're more likely to be successful with a private school than a public school, in that they're, they're more likely to be open to homeschoolers, but that is uh, certainly not a universal thing. Um, you'll find that, that some places, uh, public schools are very friendly, uh, others not. But definitely you'll want to be reaching out to schools early on to see See if you can. Uh, similarly, if you know other parents in your area who have older students who might have been through this, they will probably know which schools are, are easy to work with and which schools are less easy to work with. And so those are going to be your best resource for, okay, you want to take this, this AP test. These two schools offer that AP test. This other school does not offer that AP test. And one of them is really easy to work with. You should talk to them first. But those, again, that's something you'll be wanting to work on. If you know that your senior year, you're going to be taking a certain AP test, then the end of your junior year, certainly by August of your senior year, you want to have made contact with schools to, to get on that list. So you're not trying to jump through hoops and figure out what to do in February. Yeah, that's really too late. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So much for that. Right. Yeah. For us with the PSAT, I have a note on my calendar based on my experience last year. On this day, I need to call that school and, and ask if he can take the PSAT this year. And in time for her to do what she needs to do for ordering the the person who's doing the ordering on that side. So I put that note on my calendar last year when it was done so that because I knew it would, you know, slip my mind. So that's there waiting for me as I go into the next year. And with the AP exam, it ended up being a continuing conversation once I found, I mean, several of them just were a flat no. And then I found one that was willing to consider it based on how things shook out with them administering the AP test at all to their students based on of the conditions of the world at the time. And so we kept in contact with each other for a long time and we didn't know one way or the other. So we at our house prepared for him to take the exam as though he would be able to, so that it wasn't a matter of, oh, okay, now, <laughs> now get with it. And it's, you know, tomorrow. So it required a lot of vigilance and patience. Okay. So some other things to think about. We've got most of the pieces together for the applications and moving forward with the selection of colleges and discerning which one out of those will be the one, at least for now. Other pieces to consider would be, I think, Everett, the dimension of sports and as people using Colby. However, how do we bring those together if, if students are looking to play sports in college? 
right? So if you have a student who excels at a particular sport and you're thinking that they may want to play competitively uh, in college uh, and the key differentiation is will they play as a part of a school sponsored team or will it be more of a club team? Uh, there are a number of sports that are club sports that you can play that you might still travel around and play, but they aren't officially sponsored by the, the, the school's athletic department. Okay. Um, if you are wanting to play a competitive sport um, at a particular college or university, really, the earlier you can identify that, the better. If you have an idea that you might be doing that, um, if you know freshman or sophomore year, then you should start working on that now and thinking about that now. Uh, but basically, the way it works is there are two primary organizations that govern college athletics in the United States. Um, the NCAA, a National Collegiate Athletic Association, is the biggest one, the one that most people know. Uh, there's a smaller one called the NAIA that, that primarily deals with smaller schools. But both of them are out there, and that's something you want to be aware of. If you are likely to be playing competitive athletics in college, then in addition to being in contact with the admissions department at the school that you'll be attending, you'll also be in contact with the athletics department at that school. Okay. Now, in good news, most athletic departments, particularly at, at larger schools, are going to have someone who will help you through this process as well, kind of take you through what are you going to need to do to, to play sports? What do you need to be to be eligible? Because there are rules about what you need to have done in high school for you to be eligible to play sports in college, primarily dealing with your academic eligibility. They want to make sure that you will actually be a student um, in attending the school. The NCAA in particular has probably the most burdensome of the regulations. Um, the NCAA is a massive bureaucracy uh, and paperwork is kind of their deal. <laughs> Regarding students who have some form of home-based education, about a decade ago, they made the decision that rather that regardless of accreditation types, uh, for the most part, they were going to lump them all into what they called umbrella schools um, if you were attending a school like Colby. Um, if you're homeschooling on your own, you'll be a straight homeschooler. Um, but if you're, you're doing some sort of home-based education with us, then, then you're considered as a member of Colby, as an umbrella school. And what that means is that we can provide transcripts to them still. You don't have to do transcripts. We'll be able to provide a verification of graduation. Uh, however, they have some additional paperwork they're going to want from you that they wouldn't require at a more traditional school. The paperwork, it's called the, the NCAA Core Course Worksheets. There's a certain number of core courses that you have to take to be eligible. It's kind of like college admissions. You need to have you know, three English courses and three math courses. So there's a minimum set of courses that you have to take for the NCAA to play in college. And if you are going through an umbrella school, like they currently consider Colby to be, then you'll need one of these worksheets for each of the courses. Now, in good news, if you're doing Colby courses, all of our courses have been approved in the past, and we have never had any issues with them. But you have to fill out what's the name of the course, who designed the course, Colby, um, what books are being used, who's grading the course, in this case, probably someone locally, uh, whether it's parent or otherwise. So you can fill out one of these sheets for every single one of the courses, and then you'll be turning them in to the NCAA for verification. Uh, the reason I mention having an eye on this early on is because if you know freshman or sophomore year that's going to be happening, it's much easier to be doing those core course worksheets as you're doing the courses mm -hmm. than it is to wait until your senior year and, and have to go back and, and try and figure out what needs to be on those worksheets for each of your courses. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So, but certainly if you have any questions about playing sports, uh, playing uh, particularly NCAA athletics, um, that's something, go ahead and reach out to us. Um, I'd be the primary contact for that, and I can talk you through maybe some more of the details about how we, we go about working with you uh, to get that done. But we do have, every year we have somewhere probably in the five to ten students uh, from our graduating class who do go on to play athletics at the next level. Wow. Um, so it's certainly something that can be done. It's not a, a major issue. It just involves some extra paperwork. Okay. One of those things. Good to know. Put it on the list. All right. Lots of helpful stuff. Feeling better already talking through this as we're sort of getting our ducks in a row here, getting with the program. Colby offers a lot in the way of college counseling and assistance at, through this whole process, including college planning webinars. Those come up frequently, and then they're recorded and posted for viewing later asynchronously. Those can be accessed on the Colby website. And then you also have virtual college visits that come up throughout the year. Those are fairly recent, right? And I'd love to hear more about those. So I think we're in year four of our virtual college visit program. Uh, it, and it's grown, really expanded, uh, you know, over that time. When we first started, we just had a couple of them. And what the programs are is it's an opportunity for uh, Newman Guide Catholic Colleges generally to come and give a presentation, usually of general interest, followed by a presentation on the school itself. Um, so it's an opportunity for you to get a chance to hear from a representative of the school and, and speak with them about the school, hear about them, ask questions, uh, whatever it might be. Um, I know uh, Erica's got a number of those scheduled for this coming fall, starting in September or October, I believe. We're hoping to publish a, a, a calendar that everyone can reference. We're not there yet, but we'll be pushing that information out. And 
hope everyone can come. This is a great way to visit schools without having to get a hotel room Mm -hmm. (laughs) or drive long distances. You can get an idea of what the representatives are like and the presentations. I went to almost all of them last fall. They were wonderful. They were really interesting and a great opportunity for juniors and seniors in particular to ask questions, get a feel for the school and see about a lot of you guys probably can anticipate the normal things they'll talk about, but they also talk about really cool stuff like their study abroad programs and other things that a student might see and say, wow, I didn't know about that. That's cool. And I want to do that. Yeah. So it's an opportunity to see some unique things about the schools too, that maybe are not yet on, on the radar. Yeah. I was thinking it would be a good way to kind of start that elimination process, but also to add to the list. I can see the list growing from these. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Changing at least from, yeah, after visiting that. That's great. So, okay. And in upcoming episodes, we'll be talking about routes other than college after Colby. So stay tuned for those. We've got a number of resources that we're going to post in our show notes that will hopefully help families, including a couple of previous Colby Cast episodes. We spoke with Dr. Donald Prudlow, who is a professor at the University of Tulsa on episode 40, Windshield Time. He spoke from the viewpoints of both professor and father who's been through this process, the college selection process. We spoke with Jeremy Tate of the Classic Learning Test as well. We'll put links to those episodes in our show notes, along with a number of other things. We always like to Um, highlight the availability of the advisors at Colby to reach out and ask questions directly of families assigned advisors. What else am I missing? One last thing, I do have an exciting announcement. Uh, Colby's been working on expanding our college partnership program um, and developing more formal partnerships with colleges. Um, This is going to involve some marketing opportunities. It may involve expanded course offerings. Um, We're hoping to eventually get into targeted scholarships. So stay tuned for more information over the next three to six months about this this expanded college partnership program that we're going to be building out. Many of you may know about our partnership with the University of St. Thomas in Houston to offer dual credit courses, um, which we're very happy with. And we've had some smaller partnerships over the years. Uh, Recently, we had a partnership with Magdalene College, and they were offering a a scholarship targeted specifically to Colby students. So we're working to offer more of those opportunities coming soon. Uh, So wait for uh, upcoming announcements. Great. Well, Everett and Erica, I sure appreciate all of these details, all these things you've given us to think about this time you've taken with me today to to get us off on the right foot with all this college planning. Thank you both so much. Thanks, Bonnie. Happy to be here. Thank you. Mary, our mother, pray for us. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Ad maiorem Dei Gloriam. 